Okay, Thad Beckham here. Uh, been in the sport of primitive archery for decades. I really love it. Can't get away from it. Can't get enough of it. Um, it's just cool to me to be able to combine primitive skills, hunting, bows and arrows, history, culture, the whole thing in one package. Survival skills. It's all one package. And I think that's what kept me interested in this so long. Uh, flint mapping, fire making, string making, bow making. I mean, it's all interrelated. Having a super arrow that flies like a laser, a super sharp point, that arrow matches your bow and shooting at your feel good weight. You got total control over your bow. You're going to be very dangerous with that bow. Okay, Thad Beckham here. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, the wind's really blowing. We got a hurricane kind of coming in to the east coast of Florida. Uh, I don't think it'll be too bad here, but that's what's happening. Um, I wanted to talk about a bow that I built in 1995. It was a Sudbury bow, the famous Sudbury bow built in 1660. And uh, the Wampanoag Algonquin Coastal Atlantic Bow, um, New England Bow. But anyway, I um, always loved the design of it. I thought it was really a cool looking bow, and it's a long bow, so I, you know, I like long bows. They're smooth, and, and the original, uh, mine was built on the original, and the original measurements were, I'm going to read them to you, uh, so I don't want to get it. I don't want to get it wrong. So here we go. It was 67 and 1/8 inches long. This bow is 66. Okay. Um, right below the pin knock here, the original was 3/8 of an inch thick, and this one is 3/8 of an inch thick. Um, the original was three quarters inches wide, just below the pin knot, right where the limb starts to widen. And this one is five sixteenths to maybe three, maybe three eighths. It's hard to tell. I got these uh, uh, wrap on knocks. I mean, the, the tips are so fine. I had to wrap on knocks, which is what I planned to do originally. Uh, the belly. On the original was one and seven eighths mid limb. This one is one and seven sixteenths. Surprised I didn't write the back. But anyway, the back on this one is one and a quarter. So it's got the trapezoid limbs like the original, but the bow's just much more streamlined. The handle area. The hourglass handle area, which I really like the hourglass shape. Uh, this helps with your bow, your arrow clearance. On the original, mine's 15 sixteenths. On the original, was 15 sixteenths. And the thickness of the handle on the original was 1 and 3 sixteenths. And mine is 1 and 1 eighth. Um, you know these measurements are just so usable. I mean, depending on the piece of wood you got and and how you treated that, you know. But anyway, that's the original specs compared to this bow. Now, this bow is very different, very, very different. What I did, I fire hardened it. And when I fire hardened it, you know, I reduced a lot of mass off of it, but I put it over the coals and uh, let the heat penetrate the limbs slowly got a good fire hardening on it and i had it set back on a form a couple inches none of that was done with the original you know but like i said i'm making some radical changes to try to improve this bow so after it come off the fire i put a couple of layers of sinew on it and i only sinew to you know from there's very light sinew in the handle area. Most of the sinew is like right here where the limb starts to get wide. 
to right here where it starts to narrow drastically. Now the original didn't do this, but I kind of combined the designs of the old home guard uh, bow from Denmark, which had these very light outer tips, which you know this is a benefit as far as hand shock, and they kind of act like levers, uh, lot of levers. I mean this really helps. I like it. And you know you're getting your power out of the width here. The narrow back and the wide belly makes sense with hickory because hickory's very good in tension strength, but it lacks in compression strength. So the fire hardened helped with the compression and added the sinew to hold the form. I let this thing dry for a long time and uh, I believe all summer. I just let it sit pretty much all summer. And I started floor tillering it and I got it down to where it was just barely bending and cleaned up the sinew and put me a earth pigment paint on it. Um, black charcoal and red ochre. And made my art design on the back. But you know, sinew was not used here in the southeast. I mean, it was it's just completely too humid and wet. And so what I did, I just, after it cured, I just sprayed it with some uh, polyurethane because without that here in the southeast, it is not going to work. You are not going to get a workable bow that you can use. I mean, you could use it sometimes, but most of the time it's going to be a flop. So before I even tillered this thing, I put the finish on the sinew to keep the sinew from absorbing moisture. And if you notice, I only sinewed out to here. All of this is raw hickory, um, fire hardened hickory. So I wanted to reduce the weight. I didn't want to add weight on these tips. Um, there was no need. There's no need for sinew on hickory to begin with, but I wanted to experiment with this. I had a lot of people ask me about send you by hickories and I say why not I mean absolutely why not because when you fire harden a bow you reduce a lot of mass which we just seen between the old and the new bow and uh, when you lighten the bow up like that and reduce all the mass off of it you, you add sinew sinews heavy so um, you're not getting a, a negative like you would with the raw hickory and the heavy weight of the raw hickory and then adding sinew. I use a card scraper, sandpaper. For the final tiller, is, I mean, I don't want to put wood marks into my wood. I want my bow to be clean when I finish tillering pretty much, so I do some light sanding. Um, the card scraper is wonderful. Uh, it's one of my favorite tools, that and the gizmo. I mean, I like using the gizmo. And one of the reasons, a car scraper really cuts good, but it slows you down. So at that stage of bow building, that's when you want to slow down. You don't, I mean, I know it's easy to get impatient, but you don't put all that time into this bow. And when you get there, just a little bit of non-focus or trying to rush, you can blow it. So. I would say at that point, a lot of times if I start to lose focus, you know, I feel myself getting a little impatient with what's happening with the tiller process. I just unstring it, go inside, wait till the next day or wait till that evening or something and come back out. And you come back out with a new focus and a fresh mind and, you know, maybe you achieved a little more patience the second time you come out. I also do a lot of pulling in between and I'm working my way down but with this bow this is the main part of this video I'm not using a scale so how am I tillering well I tiller a little bit I do a lot of pulling I pull it I pull it on the tillering tree and I'm flexing those limbs I'm trying to get the limb to realize it's weaker and I don't like surprises later so that's why I do that and I have good success doing that but I didn't use a scale on this bow this is the main thing I'm trying to uh, relay to you here is I built this bow to my feel-good weight. And 
what I did I would just remove wood you know it's too strong remove wood check the tiller make sure everything's staying balanced flex the limbs little by little by little and I get here and when I get to my final tiller my final draw and that's another thing you got to know your final draw not a fictitious draw um, I know a lot of guys want to draw as far back as they can and you know that kind of thing but be really critical of yourself be really honest with your draw if you ain't got but a 25 inch draw that's what you got you could be better served to tiller that bow there than to tiller it to 27 and you really don't draw to 27 so yeah that's something to look at and I think a lot of people could probably look at that and be a little more critical um, on measuring that actual draw so anyway the whole thing I'm trying to emphasize here is to tiller the bow to your feel good weight because if you got control over that bow and that bow's sitting here and you're feeling really good about it and you're not struggling you're not fighting the draw weight you know you're gonna be in better shape as far as shooting an arrow and a guy that can handle his bow is gonna be better at taking game or shooting targets or whatever he does than the guy that's struggling and yeah maybe you can handle 65 70 pounds sure uh, but you could be much better with your feel-good weight so uh, I'm just saying you can throw the scale away and don't be disappointed if the weight isn't um, you know as strong as your buddy's bow he may not be shooting his desired weight or his practical weight and that's what you want to do because I'm going to tell you a guy that control his bow in the hunt he's going to take more game and the last two or even shoot targets but the last two bows I built I built on that theory and the first bow I built it come out 46 pounds it was a straight limb not a real long hickory but an average length uh, about 61 inches I believe and uh, I took three deer with it first year it's 46 pounds okay the next bow I built uh, was set back in the handle uh, it was set back a couple inches it was sending you back fire harden it come out to 47 pounds it was about an inch longer now this bow um, is 66 inches it come out to 48 pounds man it feels good back here I mean it feels good and I know one thing when I go in the woods with this bow, I'm going to feel like a predator able to take game. And, you know, instead of me fighting the bow, the bow, me and the bow is going to work together here. And um, I'll let the bow do its job. If you, if the arrow hits with all the energy in the arrow straight, you're not losing anything. You're losing energy this way. And uh, if you can handle that bow, uh, manhandle the bow, I mean, you are going to be so much better. A poundage means nothing if you can't put the arrow in the right spot. But wow, what a great bow. And I took this bow from something that I really wasn't that crazy about and turned it into right now, right now, my favorite bow and I will tell you when I get it full draw I feel just a little tiny flex in the handle not much but just a little bit at full draw but man I can I can pull this bow back and I can sit here and determine where that arrow is going to go with confidence and that's more important than anything guys you know your buddy shooting 70 pound let him shoot 70 and you know maybe he can handle that maybe he's physically able to handle that if you can handle 60 55 60 pounds 65 pound I mean great but get it there without the without the scale and then be honest with yourself am I comfortable 
can I release this string and have a beautiful follow through? Am I comfortable with this bow? My bow limb starts to fade, starts to get narrow. Uh, the concept of, of the old home guard course, this isn't um, a measurement comparison of the home guard. But um, it starts to get more narrow right in here about a foot, 12 and a half inches. It really starts to get narrow here at 10, which is at about three quarters of an inch. No, that's uh, 15, 16, excuse me. And mid limb is three quarters. And then outer limb is too narrow to cut in knocks. Almost comes to a point, wrap on knocks. To sum this up, this is a sinew back fire hardened Wampanoag Algonquin, famously known as the Sudbury with some home guard features. So, <laughs> uh, but wow, what a great bow. Uh, what is that? Yeah, what a great bow, man. I mean, I love this thing. It shoots like silk. Okay, one more thing, you know, if you are struggling with a bow, uh, just imagine how harder that's going to be when your body's cold, you've been on a stand, you've been out hunting, your hands are numb, your body's cooled down, and you're trying to pull a bow that, yeah, you can pull it, but can you shoot it accurately? And it's going to be even tougher then, so just something to think about. Um, it's a lot easier to shoot a bow during the summer in your short pants with flip-flops in the backyard um, than it is an actual winter hunting situation. So uh, making a bow that fits you better and you got complete control over is going to enhance your ability to perform with that bow. So you and the bow are working together. Okay, to recap, I guess, is don't keep up with the Joneses. Don't worry about what your buddies are shooting. Make your bow fit you like a glove. So you got total control over your bow through the whole shot process. Accuracy is going to beat poundage every time. And if you're out there and you're one of these beefed up guys and you can shoot 70 pounds accurately over and over, even in cold weather and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you could shoot better with a lighter bow. But if you still want to do that, you can handle it. Yeah, well, this is build the bow to your feel-good weight. If that feels good to you, that's fine. If 60 pounds feels good to you at, at the back end and you got total control, go with it. But it's not for me, and uh, I think it's not for a lot of people, and that's why I'm showing you this video. You know, if you think about it, that's the way bows were made for thousands of years. They, you know, nobody had a scale. They just made the bow to fit them, and you can do that too. So, you know, a preconceived weight on a bow may not be what you need to do. Elizabeth Warren here. I got my bow and arrow I made. Bernie Sanders made my arrow. This is the way I get all my taxpayer. I meant my meat for the freezer. Yeah, I hunt bison and squirrel. Hillary did the napping for me. 